right on this uh, fall break weekend. Thanks for being here again. Uh, today we're, we're in a series on the family, uh, not uh, my perfect family, my real family. And, uh, last, last Sunday, uh, Jimmy Smith did a great job talking about parenting and some key things about the challenges of being a parent in this modern world. And uh, if you need to go back. Uh, it's, uh, it's available on our church website. You can go back and listen to that if you missed it. You'd be blessed by it. He began with a disclaimer, and he said, I'm not a perfect parent. And so I'm talking about marriage today, so I'm going to start out with a disclaimer too. Uh, I, am, I am a long way from being a perfect husband. I am no expert on this thing called marriage. Now, I know Rhonda's out of town this weekend, but I know if she was here, she would dispute that. She would say, oh no, he is, he is such an incredible husband. So gracious, so kind, so giving. But since she's not here, uh, you'll just have to take my word for that. And you don't need to ask her about it either. <laughs> so we're talking about marriage. And God's word has a lot to say about this relationship. And so many other people have much to say about this thing called marriage. In, in the pastoral world, we end up at a lot of wedding ceremonies. And uh, Tom Rayner did a serve, online survey. He asked pastors to submit their favorite wedding stories. Just quick clips. Here's one of my favorite crazy things that ever happened at a wedding. And so I picked four of my favorites from that list. He said that one, one of the pastors that wrote in said, During the vows, do you promise love, honor, trust, serve, sickness, health, adversity, promise to be true and loyal so long as you both shall live? And the bride said, Oh, no. Uh, my favorite one, I think, out of the group, was, it was about a, an uncle, older uncle, who's kind of a spiritual patriarch for the family, and he, because of health, he wasn't able to be there for the wedding. And they'd wanted him to read a scripture, and he said, if you could read on my behalf, 1 John 4, 18, that's what, what I would want to read if I was there. And so, 1 John 4, 18, and for, it's a beautiful, there is no fear in love, instead, perfect love drives out fear. But the person, a younger member of the family, who said, oh, sure, I'll read on his behalf, said, this is from Uncle so-and-so, and, and, and read John 4.18, not 1 John 4.18. Now, there's a dramatic difference in those two verses, because John 4.18 says, for you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. <laughs> Verse references are very important in the Bible. Uh, we appreciate our folks who volunteer in the sound booth, and it's, it's, you're so on display, and you're so vulnerable there, because it goes bad, and everybody just looks at you, and I appreciate them having the faith and the perseverance to, um, to move forward. But in this one, man run the sound booth, he, the bride had given him a CD that had just a whole lot of songs on it, but go to this track, this track, this track, to get the right one, and so he thought he had the right one, but he did not have the right one. Several songs in the, in the ceremony, but when it got to this point, he pushes the button, and the, and the gathered congregation at the wedding got to enjoy a fine rendition of The Lady is a Tramp. <laughs> a couple requested, this is the last one, a couple requested that a pastor do a beach wedding, but they said, but before, before we make it official that we want you to do it, we need to see your bare feet to make sure that it's going to be acceptable for our wedding pictures. So I fear I would have failed that test. We put a lot of time and energy and resource into wedding ceremonies in our country. I mean, at a ridiculously high level. And here's the thing. A lot of couples, they spend a lot of time on the getting married part, they don't spend nearly so much time, energy, effort, and resource on the being married part. And that's where the challenges come in. How do, how do you do marriage well in this complicated world in, in which we live? Now, today, and we have, we've done a lot of sermons about marriage over years together, and we've addressed all the challenges and the the pitfalls and how do you dig out and how do you work together and you just don't know what my husband's like you just don't know what my wife is like and here's what happened and here's why marriage did not go well for me and there there really are a lot of those stories and and genuine stories and God is a God of grace and love and forgiveness and glory and he can work through all those things but today 
is not so much a day to, to do a, hey, here are five, five ways to make your marriage stronger kind of sermon. Uh, we'll have some direct applications, but what I'd like to do today is a little different than that. I want to, I want to, I want to set the bar as high as the Bible does. Instead of looking at all the, well, here's where it went bad, here's what we could do differently, here's, here's, here's why my, things didn't work out for me in marriage and love, uh, instead we're going to say, here's God's plan for marriage. And, and to have an expanded vision for marriage, and not just for those of you who are married, not just for your marriage, but for marriages. I want to, I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 5, and this is a powerful statement on marriage. And Ephesians 5, Paul's talking to a church and he's talking a lot of most of his letters is the first part is a doctrinal part and then there's a practical application part. He addresses specific issues. Now he's into the practical application specific issues, not the big doctrinal sweep of earlier in Ephesians. In Ephesians 5, he says, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he expands on that. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we're members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. What is marriage? Early September, I came across this article, and it, it was challenging a viewpoint in our society where there's, there's this view that they're dramatic. We've seen plenty of their dramatically different views for our country, views about a lot of things in the last week. When it comes to marriage, we, the challenge has been, well, Bible-believing Christians have this view of marriage, and people who don't have this view of marriage, and it's dramatically different. And here's what the article said. That just may not be so. It's from a book by Todd Wilson. This is called Mere sexuality, rediscovering the Christian vision of sexuality. He said, we don't face this problem that Christians have this view of marriage and non-Christians, non-believers have this view of marriage. He said, actually, they have pretty much the same view of marriage. And it's interesting. He said, the one most held by society for sure, but sadly also by the church is what he calls in this book a companionate understanding of marriage. That marriage is mostly just companionship. It's just us having a good time together. It's primarily about what makes me happy and what makes my life easier. And that there's this emotional attraction between us. And at such a time as those things fall away, the marriage falls away. And that's true for Christians and non-Christians. It's true in a same-sex marriage. It's true in a heterosexual marriage in our land. It's the same view. Companionate marriage. Now... Certainly, that's the, we'd say, oh, that's the wider society view, but it's also the view of a lot of Christians. And if you read Christian literature, you're reading books, and you're watching Christian movies and television, wedding ceremonies, wedding reception speeches, anniversary posts on social media, there are a lot of people who are going to attend a church in Collin County today who would say, isn't that what marriage is supposed to be? I mean, you, you fall in love, you find your soulmate, this emotional attraction. That's what marriage is all about. Do you know, I did some research last night. This year, that message is going to be declared 60 times in Hallmark movies. 
Yeah, that's right. Preemptive strike. Because there are 20 of those are Christmas movies. Yeah, Hallmark movies. That's what love always looks like in Hallmark movies, right? Gentlemen, are you with me on this? Amen? You guys are cowards. You know how you feel. Yeah. Listen, the biblical understanding of marriage is so much more than a companionate understanding of marriage. It's a covenant before God. It's a man and a woman coming together under the authority of God, looking to God. And that's the marriage that fulfills, and that's the marriage that lasts. And feelings, I'm telling you, they're going to come and go. Commitments waver. A covenant before God is a different kind of relationship. So what is marriage? When we talk about marriage from a biblical perspective in our church from our wedding policies, we, we don't do uh, weddings, though, here. We do covenant marriage ceremonies because anybody can do a wedding. There are wedding venues all over North Texas. But when you talk about a relationship to God of a hu- husband and a wife who love Jesus and they're going to come together in this relationship together, that's going to be a different kind of thing. So in our policy, we talk about covenant marriage. Here's what we say. Covenant marriage is the uniting of one man and one woman in a commitment for a lifetime. Because that's how the Bible talks about marriage. It's God's unique gift to reveal the union between Christ and his church. That's what Paul talks about. And to provide for the man and woman in marriage the framework for intimate companionship, the channel for sexual expression according to biblical standards, and the ideal means for procreation and nurture of children. We believe... That Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 is the normative expression of Christian marriage. Sexual activities to be enjoyed exclusively between a man and a woman who have been joined together in covenant marriage. All other sexual activity is a violation of biblical standards. Today, when it comes to marriage and family, so much of that is viewed as a social uh, agreement. And you enter into that or you sever it at will. Because our highest value in our culture is my own free will, and what works for me. And if one or both partners decide, well, I think, I think I can upgrade. I think I can switch. I think I can change. I think I can do better. I think I'm just tired of doing it with you, and I want to do it with someone else for a season. There's nothing to keep people from pursuing their own self-interest, their self-realization, self-fulfillment. And to be sure, there's plenty of talk about the cost of divorce and what it does in in the lives of children of divorce. But what happens is that folks say, well, there's a toll there, but I think they'll overcome it and it's worth paying that price so they don't give up my most cherished principles, choice, and freedom. By contrast, the Bible makes clear that at its root, Marriage and family are not human arrangements and human traditions. It, marriage is created in the heart of God. It's God's idea from the very beginning. It is for the purpose of carrying forward the, the message of the gospel itself. And uh, that's what Ephesians declares so clearly. It's just keeping with Jesus' words. Uh, and this is where uh, in, in Matthew 19, Jesus challenged. Hey, so what about divorce? It's a hot, that was the hot topic. And religious people, I mean, well-meaning spiritual people, were divided right down the middle over what marriage was and what marriage wasn't and when's it okay to blow it up. And they said, okay, Jesus, step into this and give us a good answer. Tell us which direction to go in these two schools of thought about, about marriage. And Jesus, he said... Instead, instead of dealing with, you know, what if and this and how do we, he just says, here's God's plan in the beginning. Well, that, that takes it back, right? God created a male and female. Man shall leave his father and mother, he's not his wife, two should become one flesh. Jesus' vision for marriage in Matthew 19 is a man and a woman together for life under the authority of God. That's what marriage is in God's great plan. Jesus said, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. This is more than a human social contract uh, and an emotional agreement for a season. It's a divinely instituted covenant. Covenant's a key word. Uh, A covenant is, it's like a contract, except you say, okay, this is a marriage covenant. Here's a man, here's a woman. 
But the witness to the covenant is God himself. And it's God himself that carries it forward. It's God himself that makes it work. It's God himself that carries uh, the, the authority over the relationship. It's God who joins together marriage partners in that vow. Because God is eternal. It is till death do us part. Now, the Bible says that God created marriage for a purpose bigger than itself. That marriage is to be a picture, a lived out illustration. A picture of a believer's relationship with God and that's where Ephesians takes us to a whole new level that Paul quotes the Old Testament this mystery is profound but I am saying it refers to Christ and the church marriage is an earthly picture of a spiritual relationship that exists between Christ the bridegroom and the church his bride and that 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 runs all the way through Scripture. You find like a book like Hosea, where it is Hosea's marriage that becomes the illustration of God's relationship to his people Israel. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb when we get to the, get to the revelation. We start out with a man and a woman that God brings together uh, for his glory and to love and serve him. And that's why it's important for us to work at developing Christ honoring relationships with our spouses because you're working on a portrait of Christ in the church and the world is watching the world is watching this and the one of the things that we hear is folks saying Christians are getting divorced at about the same level as the secular world so they must not really believe this that much listen this is a big part of our Christian testimony that we're, we're, we're wavering in Human marriages are miniature shared platforms on which the gospel itself is on display. And that's the powerful message of this passage. Now, whatever, and 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 again, that's the sweeping vision. I know there's hard. I know there's difficult. I know there are a lot of circumstances out there. But this is God talking about what marriage is to be. So whatever state you're in, because some of you, see, you're, you're married, you're single, you're divorced, you're widowed. But here's the command of the Bible, and this is why we're going to run this out to everybody today. Because the Bible commands everyone to honor marriages. Hebrews 13, let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Everyone, married or not, ought to support marriage, ought to honor marriage. And what does that look like? It means that you're going to pray for marriages. You're going to encourage marriages. You're going to seek to help strengthen marriages wherever you can step in in practical ways to help marriages come together. And all these things I'm talking about, we're talking about a, a man who loves Jesus and a woman who loves Jesus. And that's the covenant marriage because that's God's plan for what marriage should be. And I know that there are a lot of other things. There are a lot of circumstances. Everybody's got a story. God works in everybody's story. But this is God's sweeping plan. When we look at marriage from God's perspective in Ephesians 5, just some quick points of application. There's mutual submission. Most of the controversy about this passage relates to wives submit to your husbands. That's verse 22. And uh, all these uh, verse references and paragraph dividers, those came later. And this is one of those times you can't separate verse 22 from verse 21. Where... As believers in Christ, you submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That all of us, I give up my rights, I give up my preferences, I give up my wants in order to give it over to the person, to to other believers. And when you have a man and a woman who are both believers and they get married, that same truth is going to carry over. We submit to one another out of fear of Christ. And then... Uh, we'll do this from the message paraphrase, uh, verses 21 22, because it's a good commentary on, this, on those two verses. Out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The word submit that Paul uses uh, has an interesting origin. It, it's almost uh, always used in a military format when you find it in Greek literature. And so it's interesting that he would use this particular word. And it referred to uh, a soldier and that soldier submitting to his commanding officer. How many of you serve in the military? God bless you. All over. Thank you for your service. 
How many of you, when you got to basic training, and they said, okay, we're getting up 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, whenever they woke you up, you said, you know, I appreciate it, but I'm more of a night person. <laughs> that would not go well for you, would it? Yeah, that's not, that's not how things are structured. When, when, when you're in the military, you don't determine when you get up and when you go to bed. They determine it. You don't determine when you eat and what you eat. They, it's determined for you. You submit to authority of another. You submit to the control of another. And here we say in marriage, I'm going to surrender my independence. I'm going to surrender my strong will. I'm going to surrender what I want for the sake of another. And that's a foundation for marriage. Now, wives have typically received the brunt of, uh, of this. And uh, you, you read it and you say, wives, submit to your husbands. My goodness, husbands, we never get past that first, uh, that verse 22. But then when you read the next few verses... Oh, my goodness. Uh, s- s- love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Uh, there's, the, there's your high calling of headship in, in marriage, of leadership in a marriage relationship. The husband's head over the wife is Christ, the head of the church, his body, himself, its Savior. Love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her. In the, in the teaching, he's, run, he's running on two tracks as he goes through. He's talking about marriage. He's talking about the church. Because he's writing this to a bunch of Christians in a church and he says so he, he'll bounce back and forth in the illustration love your wives of Christ love the church how did Christ love the church oh in every imaginable way with great sacrifice and great love and great grace and that's what marriage should look like great sacrifice great love great grace sacrificial love verse 25 Jesus didn't love the church to say I'm going to love the church in a way that is in my best interests. That's not how you love the church. He laid down his life for the church. And you should lay down your life for your spouse. It's that kind of love that is that uh, agape love. It's the same word we talked about about three weeks ago in John 21. It's the same kind of love we find in John 3.16. And it has just about nothing to do with how you feel about each other on any given day. It's not about how you feel. It's about a commitment. It's, a, it's about a sacrifice. It's about giving. It's an active kind of love. It's something that you do. And you do it sacrificially. Selfless commitment. The word translated there. Verse 28. Uh, present tense. Husbands love your wife. If your own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. It says you do that. And you keep on doing that. And you keep on doing that. It's not just at birthdays. It's not just anniversaries. It's not just when you feel like it. It is all the time. Love her as Christ loved the church and love her as you love and care for yourself. And if you will do that, husbands, your wife will be more than glad to love you back and to follow your leadership, spiritual leadership at home. Be selfless in your commitment. And then servant leadership. Jesus was and is the sinless son of God, God in the flesh. You remember how the night, the night before he was crucified, he's the leader, I mean, he's a, he's he's. King of kings, Lord of lords, all that. But he washed his disciples' feet. He he was in charge. But he did the simple and the servanthood stuff. And in marriage, you, you lead by doing the simple and servanthood stuff. One of the reasons marriages have trouble is because we start keeping score. You you did you do this and I'll do this. If you'll, if you'll mow the yard, I'll take care of this in the house. If you'll do, and it's this transactional kind of relationship, back and forth. And if you don't hold up your end of the bargain, I don't feel obligated to do my part of things. We have way too many scorekeepers in marriages in our country, not enough servants. You start doing that, you'll both be blessed by it. And, who, and somebody's got to go first. Be the person to go first. How about clear priority? Your marriage is to be above all other human relationships and under the authority of Christ. That, that leave and cleave, to attach yourself, like, uh, to, to stick like glue to one another. And he says leave and cleave, but in the culture, it's important to remember this man, this woman, they get married, and you know where they went? They went to live with the father's family, the, the, the husband's family. They didn't abandon his family. They went to live with him. But in, in that relationship where he is living, 
in, an, in a compound, a place with his parents, his first commitment is going to be to her, not to them, even in that setting. That you're going to be more committed to one another than to your, your family of origin, going to be more committed to one another than to your children, that you're going to have the highest level of commitment, clear priority, and there's not an escape clause to this. Because as soon as there's an escape clause, it's going to be used. Ephesians 5 kind of marriage makes the gospel visible on earth. And that's the vision for this, this kind of Ephesians 5 marriage. It, is, it brings hope to people who thought th- there's just no hope for, for, for relationships that are meaningful anymore. It, it defines love for folks who thought that there was no way they were ever going to experience love in this world. And that's why biblical marriage deserves courageous loyalty today. So the definition of marriage, the purpose of marriage is not a peripheral issue to the Christian life. So, well, I'm a Christian and marriage is over there somewhere. The gospel itself is wrapped up in marriage and we cannot discard marriage so quickly, so easily when the gospel is tied to it. Covenant. I want to tell you about a, a guy. And I'll introduce you to him in a moment. I'll tell you about this guy. I know better than anybody else in the world, I guess. Um, and, and I wish that I could talk to him and say, marriage is awesome. And it has a load of problems that go with it. It can be a real challenge. And I wish I could communicate uh, about uh, communication and conflict resolution and managing money and how that works when you're together. All those things we talk about in premarital counseling. and how to, how to make marriage last and how to forgive a lot and how to ask for forgiveness a lot. And I, I wish that I could throw all that thing to this guy but I don't think he, he would have ever heard it. I want to show you a picture of him. He's that guy. He was 14 years old when he got married. <laughs> and in December, December the 28th, 1985, standing there with his beautiful bride, he had read lots of books about marriage, and he had gone to counseling about marriage, and but, uh, and he had, he had some understanding about this covenant thing. There's a lot he didn't understand about marriage, that's for sure. He had a lot of growing to do. And uh, now after almost 33 years of uh, being married, that, couple, that young couple right there, uh, there's a lot they know about marriage they didn't know 33 years ago. A lot they've learned, a lot of, a lot of things that God has formed and shaped in, in that couple's life over the course of this time. And uh, I think about that guy up there and what I know about him and what marriage was like when they first got married, as wonderful and all as it was, and how they just knew God brought them together. But also, with that couple uh, and that guy especially, uh, he just dumbs a stump at so many things. He... uh, he said, I do, but he had no idea what he was doing. Um, but over years, here's what's happened with that guy. is He's continued to, he read three books about marriage this year, in 2018. Try to get better at some areas of marriage. And he's still reading and trying and leaning into this at every turn to try to get better at it. And he's, he's not where he wants to be. But he's not where he was in 1985 either when they got married. And uh, he has a feeling that uh, there's a future him out there somewhere who has a lot to say to present day him about things he still needs to grow in and learn and develop. That guy was a seminary student. He had a lot of Bible background, a scholarly sort. Uh, Had a lot of answers and a lot of uh, a lot of ideals about ministry and about life. And uh, in the years since 1985, God's chiseled away at that part of him too. 
And things about his character, things about his pride, things about his, what's important and what's not important. And uh, now, this many years later, over 30 years later, uh, he's not that guy anymore. But he still has a long way to go in a whole lot of things. But what he does know then and now is that there's a covenant in that marriage and there's a covenant in that relationship to Christ and it's a, it's a glorious, glorious relationship because of Jesus in both of those. And that's what he knows. The Apostle Paul grabbed some of this covenant language in uh, that second part of that guy's life. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, Until he comes. When a Christian. A believer. Partakes of the Lord's Supper. Communion. He's celebrating. She's celebrating the fact. I am a spiritual beneficiary. Of a new covenant. That that Jesus. By his body. Which reminds us of his sinless humanity. His perfect righteousness. His substitutionary death. He's our substitute for sin at the cross. Reminds us that cup, blood red, symbolizes a new covenant Jesus created. A new way of relationship. A new level of relationship with God. Made possible by his blood shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. So when he wrote to these Christians at Corinth, the Apostle Paul grabbed these words that Jesus had taught, and in 1 Corinthians 11, he shared them as he instituted, declared, uh, illustrated a whole new covenant relationship. When you think about marriages, think about it in those terms. The gospel itself and what Jesus did for us, and it shows us immediately our deficits and where we're going to come up short and where we're not going to going to measure up to God's glorious visionary standard but it also challenges us forward in how we think about marriage for ourselves and how we think about it for the people around us we love the people we have influence with all those circles of influence where we touch lives and marriages and we're reminded none of that works apart from a new covenant wrapped around Jesus who gave himself for us and so it's in those That covenant of marriage illustrated here in Ephesians 5. And that new covenant declared by Christ and declared by Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. We're just reminded of how life works best and what God's plan is.